The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the speaker and do not necessarily represent the opinions of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association. Welcome to Chippa Chat, conversations in the consumer healthcare industry with Anita Brickman. Thanks for joining us for this episode where we're talking about big online retailers and what they can teach the dietary supplements industry. Engaging customers is the tip of the iceberg. Join Wayfair's Head of Product Development, Matt Phillips, and John Probe as they explore consumer engagement and how dietary supplements companies can help provide online services that build brand loyalty and keep people coming back. And here's John Trope. Thanks, Anita. And thanks to all of our listeners who are joining today. We have a really a great topic that's really of great interest in the healthcare industry and particularly in the dietary supplement industry. And that really boils down to trying to understand consumer behavior and how they've shifted their interest in both in how they acquire information and how they look for and purchase products. Today with us, I'm really excited uh, to talk to uh, Matt Phillips, who's a senior technical product manager uh, in the the e-commerce industry uh, that specializes particularly in home and lifestyle uh, products. Matt? Thanks for joining us. Thanks, John. So uh, I'm curious, man, you know, in the last uh, 12 months, uh, COVID-19 has changed the world. And and probably the biggest place it's changed or at least accelerated the world has been in, in people's comfort level of how they acquire information and where they go to get their products. And so I'm, I'm curious, and what, what have you seen uh, across your industry that... Um, maybe even shocked you, let alone change the way you guys do things in in, um, consumer product uh, packaged goods. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So, and it's, you know, uh, the the shift to online within like e-commerce has always been expected. Um, And I think this was, uh, COVID introduced an acceleration to that trend where like, depending upon who you read, there's debates of like, was it a five-year acceleration? Was it a three-year acceleration? Like are malls truly completely dead? I tend not to like think so much there. Um, But I I think that uh, what was really fascinating to observe, so I I work for a large e-commerce company that sells home products. Um, I worked in the the core funnel for a really long time. That's kind of like homepage through checkout, like piece. Uh, I owned one of the pages and was like optimizing that funnel to make sure people were passing through and adding to cart as often as possible. Um, and now I work in the uh, the, the content space, uh, building platforms for delivery of, of personalized customer content and uh, sourced articles a- across our site. Um, and, and I think one of the things that we learned early on is, you know, there are products that customers feel pretty comfortable purchasing online uh, as a baseline, right? And I think a lot of this is has to do with Amazon and the way that Amazon has like shaped our thinking around e-commerce, um, where typically it's pretty transactional. Um, it's products that you know, they're branded, you understand what you're going to get, and you can buy with confidence, right? If I go on Amazon right now and I see like a book that I want to get or uh, some cleaning products or like dog food for my dog, those are things that like, I know that they're the same thing that I can get in the store, they're branded. And and the customer relationship there is really just like, help me find this very specific thing that I need. Uh, What was interesting about COVID is like, you know, early on, like the, the shopping trends were kind of just more of that transactional behavior. It was like, oh, I, I'm afraid to go to the store or I can't go to the store. Um, and so let me go online to buy the things that I otherwise would have purchased in the store. But I feel pretty comfortable buying online, right? Still commodity products, still branded yeah. products. And then because I, I work in the home space, um, I, I have this kind of like unique view into like how customer purchasing behavior was changing over time, where we saw more purchases of the things that you'd expect as folks uh, transitioned into accepting full-time work from home. Uh, Office furniture was like 
sold out, you know, day day after day. And that was up at one point uh, last April, I think 1000% year over year, which like tells you like people were still looking for those transactional products and they were still looking for those, like it's, I need to find a thing. Do you have a good price? Are you trustworthy? Uh, but as we like built those relationships on those really transactional products, right? And we, we accumulated the customer trust and crucially, right, for what I do, gathered customer data, we were able to start, like, there's a flywheel that starts spinning. And I think what really happened with e-commerce over the last year is that flywheel just moves a lot faster because we're able to, we were able to build relationships that we wouldn't have been able to build until a year, two years, three years down the road because that person never would have came to us. Oh, yeah, so, that, so that's interesting. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious too, though, so that as people decided, hey, I got to make a purchase, right? I mean, I can imagine, right? You know, we're all sitting at home, you know, uh, we're kind of tired of doing Zoom meetings and we're tired of looking at the screen for a while. So you get up and walk around, you sit down and all of a sudden you realize, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to remodel this room, you know, <laughs> or I don't like that desk. But, but at, at what point did they make the transition to, I got to find out something that I think I'd like to have. I don't know what it is yet. And and how did you capture that interest? So I'm I'm guessing you probably have a loyal loyal customer base that came in and then started to try to find information to then make a decision, and that's kind of relevant in healthcare. But how how did you guys address that flow and that transition of consumer engagement? Yeah, uh, yeah. Every e-commerce company has like some like. Uh, customer framing where they're going from you know like way of bucketing their customers uh, the, the one that I like to use and this isn't the one that we use like globally at my company but just like I find really useful is hunters versus browsers right? You have someone that like comes in, they're super committed, they progress through the funnel really quickly. They maybe like they look at three or four products, they make that choice, they move on. And then you have your browsers who are going to take a bunch of sessions, they're going to they're going to sh- shop across multiple sites, they're, they're going to like have a much longer consideration cycle. And those are the customers where like, interestingly, if you can get them telling you a little bit more about themselves, and you can glean that from their browsing behavior, you can glean that from the pr- types of products that they're viewing, you can really like leverage personalization to like build that trust with them. I think one thing that I'm like super interested in within the space is like, what's the role that companies can play in producing content that wins those customers faster, right? Search is a massive channel. Most people are coming to sites, not by typing in a URL, but going to Google and searching for a thing that they need. And if you hit an established retailer that establishes that trust early on, and if you hit someone that maybe isn't as established, but they're winning the SEO game through either paid ads or through just like really goosing that Google algorithm in ways that, you know, are super interesting. How do you create a story about your brand and your products that is compelling enough to them to keep them around? Yeah. So, so that, that's really interesting. So, you know, the internet's been around, well, a long time. I mean, even before Al Gore invented it. Right. But, but like what, what happened to the, the original concept that got everybody excited was, you know, becoming really great at SEO, search engine engine optimization. That's got to be like old technology now, right? I mean, and, and so I'm, I'm curious when people are looking for content, like how do, how do you capture them to get their attention? So that kind of like, what's the new SEO, I guess is what my question is, but but carry that into then, how do you use that then to, to design great content that's kind of creates a push pull uh, you got to kind of tell you, use a marketing explanation or on online activity. How, how do you connect the two, the tools, the metrics, and then, you know, the call to action through content? Yeah, a- a- SEO is, I mean, still like a, a, a critical driver of traffic for, for most e-commerce companies. I think like to your content question, um, one, uh, one uh, company that I'd point to that's doing a really good job within the home space is Lowe's. Um, so Lowe's has this uh, section of their site. I think it's called like DIY or I, home ideas or I, I, I'm blanking on the exact name. Yeah. And, and it's uh, what's really great about it is like the content's really good. Um, it's like super task driven. Right. So if I search uh, like on Google, how do I install a new sync? One of the results is going to be Lowe's 
with a DIY article that walks me through with like super rich visuals, rich media, right? Lots of videos, lots of photos, lots of like good step-by-step -step instructions walking me through how to do that. And then at the end, well, of course, like now I'm introduced to Lowe's, I feel really confident and I can go and they've given me a hook that takes me into a, a page where I can view a bunch of syncs and, and make the right choice based on the article that they just gave me. Uh, the other part of it that's like, so th that content, it's awesome, it's great. Winning search is super important and introducing your customer to your brand in that really productive, less transactional way is super important. What Lowe's does that I think a lot of companies could learn from is that that experience is on an island. It doesn't exist for Google bots. It doesn't exist for Google users. It exists for Lowe's customers. It is integrated into the site tree. So if you go to Lowe's right now, and very few people in, in home are doing this, and I think more could, could really benefit, and I think more e-commerce in general could benefit from integrating your brand storytelling into your site. Um, it often, it's like an introduction that then never gets followed up on. Um, whereas Lowe's is like pitching that like throughout the customer journey and leveraging that content in multiple places. So like the platform that they built is super sophisticated. The content that they have is really great. And they're using it as multiple across multiple touch points, making it really easy to access and making it really easy to instill customer confidence and like strengthen that brand relationship. Uh, I, I think like that, like, you know, when I think about uh, dietary supplements, right? Like, and, and knowing like a little bit about like the the use of SEO in that industry and, and just like the little that I know, I think like that's a storytelling piece that could really like, uh, like integrating that storytelling more, more completely into the customer journey, leveraging every touch point you have with that customer to tell a little bit more of a story about yourself, a little bit more of a story about your brand and your products could be really impactful. Yeah. You know, if, if we look back at the, at the uh, let's call it the consumer healthcare industry in the last, say, 25 years, it's been interesting, right? It was a brick and mortar retail driven, obviously. And, and um, point of purchase decision making was as important as end destination shopping. And probably point of purchase decision making was maybe even greater than, than end destination. And then the internet came, COVID came, and people would read things about, oh, vitamin D, I gotta take vitamin D, I gotta support my immune system. They could go online through a Google search and, and find a site and then buy vitamin D. But I think even in the last, say, six months or the last 12 months, that's become much more sophisticated where people are trying to learn, like, what else is out there? If I'm taking vitamin D and, and I, I felt better after taking that, or I somehow felt stronger and protected, I gotta learn more. And I think that's the opportunity because online today is as much about not, not only the, like the DTC, direct to consumer, but it's as much of end destination shopping with a twist influenced by content. I mean, so is that part of the secret sauce of, of how, to, how to capture a customer and then engage them so they, they look at other product options on your site? Or like, what's, what, kind of what's that dynamic? And is there a secret to that? Uh, engagement piece say beyond content that you guys leverage in the industry yeah so um I, I guess what you're getting at is like once you've acquired someone how do you how do you make sure that you continue to give them like relevant offerings that that keep them coming back yeah or or even increase their basket size well they bought vitamin d but here are three other products we wish you'd buy because they were you know synergistic to vitamin d yeah right? yeah i i so i, I think on the like the the on-site experience right like if you have someone that you know is like interested in a particular supplement like the you know th there's kind of like two schools that like i've observed um there's curation which is uh, generally if you have a smaller catalog and um you can aff you don't need the scale that algorithms afford and you want to keep things a little bit more uh, tightly related, right? So I, I think the catalogs for, for a lot of uh, supplement companies are probably smaller than the catalog that we're talking about for like an Amazon, where like everything's algorithmically powered. And so maybe you, you create meaningful relationships between products and you have touch points, basically wait until the customer has expressed an interest in a particular product before trying to sell them more stuff. So don't on like the search page, right? Say, you know, oh, if you like this, you're gonna love these three other things. But like once they've made it to the product page and they've indicated an interest in something, that's a great place to introduce the other offerings and to start to explain like why those offerings relate. I, I think the other, the flip side of that, right? If you're larger and you need you this the benefit of curation, like human selected, these things actually go well together and are certified to go well together. Um, 
you know, if you can't do that because of scale reasons, um, algorithmic curation is really like the way to do it, right? Like, which is more or less, let's look at what customers viewed, let's look at what they bought, right. and let's just have a machine pick a list of products that says, um, here's, um, here's what we think is best for you. I, I think that yeah. can erode customer trust when done badly. Um, a couple of things that like I've observed just in my experience, um, the, the names we give to recommendations are really important. If you go to a, a, a large <laughs> e-commerce company, you will find that like the phrase compare similar items is really frequently used. Um, and I've heard through user interviews and I've seen just like A-B testing, literally not changing the products displayed, but changing just the name that moving to something less customers have said that feels like a machine picked it for me. It feels like it's you telling me what I should buy. And it doesn't show that you know anything yeah. about me or that you know anything about this product. More affirmative names, things that actually suggest like an action and a path forward, think like frequently bought together, right? Or more you'll love. Um, the, the company I work for really likes to play on the idea of like falling in love with the product. Um, and so like, you know, we try and thread that throughout. But like, you know, think about how transactional some of the words that you're using are. Think about how transactional the experiences that they're using are. And one other, like, sort of like, as you think about like displaying a product catalog, scale is overwhelming and it often makes things feel depersonalized and less relevant, right? Yeah. What 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 do you do on uh, you know if at, and I'm guessing that this is done uh, across uh, you know your industry is the customer footprint, right? I mean, you, as I understand it, or as I think I understand it is, is you know when a customer comes back and you know where they go and how they flow. Uh, and I guess my first question is, is that true? And then what do you do with that information to push them toward um, uh, a view of a certain category or a product and then the decision to purchase? Yeah, so through like a, a variety of tracking methodologies, uh, we can develop customer in market scores for particular products or like particular services. Um, and that's like pretty common. Uh, some some folks are way better at it than others, but you know, if you look up things like Pixel, right? Like if you're using a modern web browser and you're clicking on ads, like we're targeting things to you, right? Um, yeah. I, I think like that kind of goes to the offsite piece as much to the onsite piece. So with the onsite piece, it's leverage what you know to show things that you think are going to be appealing. Uh, the offsite piece I think can get really interesting, right? It's things like Instagram ads, anyone who's ever like visited a website to like look at products, right? Like I was on Everlane looking for t-shirts and then I went to Instagram and immediately saw an ad for Everlane t-shirts, right? They're just passing that token back and forth and trying to remind me like, hey, you liked this thing once, you'll like it again. Um, that that's effective, I, I think. And, and then like it provides me a way that I can click on their Instagram, I can start following them and I can see some of the storytelling about their brand. It also creates the opportunity for other offsite touch points. I, I continue to think, email is like, despite like the power of Gmail to make sure I never have to read an email that I'm not interested in, um, like, really it is like a super great way to, if you can create good content, not an email newsletter that goes out every day at noon and says, yeah. here are our daily sales. But like, imagine an email that like, hey, it uh, looks like you're, you're looking to, you know, bolster your immune system, here are some tips and pair that, like what you know about that customer's interest and what they're looking for with, an approach that isn't just let me sell you more, but let me integrate you into like the customer experience that we're trying to create with our product line and with our like mission as a company. So that that sounds like a little bit of a customization, which which can be applicable to healthcare, self care choices on uh, on product. I mean, is that what you, what do you guys call what you just described? Is that customization for you know like you know the habits and the and the footprint of your You're customer about, oh, personalization? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, so. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, personalization is like a hot topic, especially in the dietary supplement world. Right. So there are a number of direct to consumer sites. Now, if you go on, you have an option to take a personal assessment. You get a personal assessment mm -hmm. and then boom, you get some kind of a health configuration based off of, you know, your answers. And then, you know, here yeah. are the three products that you need to get. But but that's kind of uh, like one dimensional if, if I'm if I can describe it that way. But how do you expand that engagement? and take advantage of some of the tools that you've been describing for us. Is, is there a way to do that? Or is, is there a way to enhance the engagement once they do that? 
I, I have a little bit of experience building. I, I think like your example of like the health quiz is a is a good one. Um, I have a little bit of experience working on products like this. I, I've built like um, style quizzes. Yeah. Um, people like to tell you about themselves, right? Like what's the the story about the the software engineer who built a, a simulated therapist that just repeated back what you typed into the computer <laughs> and people didn't want to leave the computer terminal because they liked talking to it so much. <laughs> really? Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is, I, I think, like at essence, like that's that's a, a really sticky experience, right? And it can be really fun. Um, even even big brands that don't um, do immersive content super well have have like had some success here. I think there's like you know making that core value prop like super um, super fun and super shareable is is good. Those those like quizzes and things are really like they, they have three goals, right? It's like introduce you to the product catalog, win your trust by showing that well, you gave us this little bit of information about you and look at all that we were able to do with it. Is is there a key to keep the customer engaged in between visits that that is being um, employed these days by uh, the category? Within the personalization lane or just generally? Yeah, you know, or well, both, both really. I and mean, then personalization yeah. is like, you know, you sign up for it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get an, uh, an, an email every other day. But if they don't sign up for it, are there tools that you've seen to be effective? Like, uh, you know, you recently came online and looked at this faucet. Yeah. And then, you know, three days later you get, hey, you want to buy that faucet now? I mean, what? Yeah. What? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I think, you know, like I said, email retargeting can be really a powerful tool to remind the customer um and then display retargeting right like we all think it's a little creepy when you look at a pair of shoes and then the next three websites you visit there's an, a banner ad for those shoes but that is like a, an effective way of keeping the brand's presence in uh, and product line in mind with the customer right like you you want to especially if you're um is trying to form that relationship having as many touch points with the customer as possible and just staying present with them throughout like the rest of their search can be a, a really impactful tool um, yeah. I, I think like the more that you can learn in that first visit, and I think a lot of that gets accomplished, we don't give enough credit to like creating great UX that makes people want to explore a website. I think that like what like personalization is is a tool and it's a really powerful and effective tool. But in order to effectively personalize, you, you need people to tell you a little bit about themselves. Right. And you can do that through explicit signals like the quiz thing that we talked about. But you can do it through implicit signals as well, which is like if I create a really beautiful homepage, right? That has like great imagery and it's super immersive. And maybe it does that cool thing where it animates as you scroll on the page so that it's like fun and you want to keep going, yeah. right? That's a chance to show someone more of your of your site and of your experience and learn what catches their interest, right? Like if yeah. you show someone three messages and they click on one of them, clearly that's a, that's that's not uh, that that wasn't a quiz. That wasn't a a like an immersive experience that you had to build. It was just like, but they told you something really really important about themselves, which is what they're interested in. And I think the more that you can like marry excellent web experiences that are like fun and easy to use and like really immersive and and don't feel transactional to that like more transactional like let's harness a lot of customer data. Um, the more that the, you'll be able to get good inputs and good data to power um, the experiences. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I think of this as kind of like a, the, the, the digitization of healthcare or the digitization of America. Yeah. Right. And so, so all of our habits and, and interactions are changing uh, so rapidly, but, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, uh, you know, some of the stuff early at the start of this podcast, you had talked about some things that, you know, if people are listening that, ah, you know, that's, that's online 101. But you know, if you look at where it's come from and what you've just been describing to us in the last fifteen minutes or so, it, it's it's like incredible. It's like, like you know, what did we learn uh, about healthcare and online digitization from like Google Vault, Google Vault, and you know, I think even Apple had some type of uh, you know database that they were trying to get people to put their data in. Nobody used it, and most of those things failed because nobody cared that somebody could store my data. They wanted you to interpret their data to say this is what you should do. How much of that are you seeing in even in in kind of the CPG world of here? I'm going to help you decide what you're going to buy. I'm going to tell you that you need to have this. <laughs> is is, it, is that a tool of engagement uh, or interactions that's being used at all or could be used? 
Yeah, I, I think that comes down to like the, the curation versus like algorithmic driven recommendation that I was uh, talking about a little yeah. earlier where um, you know, if you have a smaller product line, um, it's you understand the relationships between the products and you can like map customer identities to those different products. And then you can, in a data driven way, like say to the customer, like, Hey, we, we saw that you're like a modern shopper, or we saw that you are an outdoorsy person. And so like, we have this awesome product line. And then you can really like say like, based on, we think you're going to love this. Um, and then the more algorithmic driven, I, I think is, what we observe more commonly, which is like, if you liked this, you'll like this. Amazon does a really good job of like that late in the funnel. Uh, like you already added two or three things to your car. You you're on your way to your cart, and then they hit you like in the cart with like, you know, I was buying like dog toys the other day, and it was like some extra like you know chewy balls or something. And it's like that is like they know that about me. Um, they are leveraging it really well, and they're using their their authority and everything that they've learned about me to say, hey, don't forget this. And like that nudge yeah. is super effective. The, the you know the the key piece of that that I think that keeps it from feeling creepy <laughs> is like the the brand relationship, right? I like I have a super transactional relationship with Amazon, but like when I order something from them, it arrives on time. It's in the condition that I expected. It's you know it, it, I can track my whole purchase, and I think like making sure that you when you're using that type of personalization or like you're you're trying to forge those customer relationships that that all of that is undergirded by trust right like we've all had like weird display retargeting ads where like you know you you see like the the thing that you were just looking at and it feels weird because that brand doesn't have a good enough relationship right, with you right. and you kind of gloss over it and maybe it it, it makes it leaves a bad taste in your mouth I, I think like we've gotten really good at personalization and I think like the next phase of that is like how do we use the entire infrastructure that we've built um and the like uh, the, the data pipelines that we have to actually help customers yeah. feel great uh, when shopping. Yeah, so what do you what do you, what do you uh, see uh, uh, kind of in the future? Right, probably uh, three years ago, uh, online sales, uh, e-commerce was was kind of uh, a convenient mm -hmm. uh, factor, and then through probably the mid to late stages of COVID, it became more of an interaction and engagement. But still convenience. But where, where do you see the future? And do you, do you see the trend and the huge percentage of growth with like online engagement continuing, or is it going to reach a plateau? How do, how do you continue to facilitate the growth, or 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 just just engagement for repeat to to go up? That's really interesting. I I think that there's definitely more room for um, online to consume. Um, physical sales. And I think that like this was all supposed or all going to happen. And it's just COVID accelerated it. Um, I, I think that the thing that I've come out of like the, the shift to online over the last year believing is that like customers are more willing to buy something online that they otherwise would have thought to be an in-store purchase. And I think that, that there's like two parts to that. It's that it just never would have occurred to them that you could buy something online. Think about like a pizza oven, right? Like you can find one of those online and buy it. Like it just, it sounds like a thing that you would need to go to a specialty store for. And the fact that like, those stores exist and can you can purchase from them online are great. Um, I, I think that the other part of that is just people got more comfortable saying, I'm going to try this thing. And I think a lot of that goes to like ease of shipping, ease of return, right? Clothing, cl online clothing companies, right? Like that's incredibly yeah. hard because things fit differently. And, you know, no one's really nailed the experience of like, can I expect that this will fit the way that I need it to when I get it? Um, so they've had to really rely on like great return policies um, in order to continue their growth. I do think like, you know, I, I'm interested as things reopen, like what the shift to physical retail looks like. It's interesting. I think it's a, a trend that I, I, I wish I understood a little bit better is like all of these like online D to C companies, um, especially clothing companies opening flagship stores. And I can remember like, you know, the two summers ago I was in Soho and there was like an Everlane store and there was like a, a Thursday Booth store. And there were like all of these online these companies that started online, you know, selling their things. They never had physical presence. And the first physical presence they buy is in the most expensive rental market in the country. And I wonder like if we're going to move more towards like showrooms um, than 
stores where you'll necessarily have the whole product catalog, right? So if you go to a, uh, you know, a, a D2C company that spins up like a, a furniture pop-up, there were a few of these in Boston last year. Um, and it's like maybe one or two looks, right? And then there are iPads around or you can, you know, it familiarizes you with the brand. It lets you establish their quality. It lets you establish a presence and for them to de- develop that relationship with you in the offline way. Um, you know, there are a few places where like, um, I think that could be really effective. And I, I think that that it as like, if, if you're an e-commerce company that doesn't have a physical presence or you're an e-commerce com- or you're a physical retailer whose growth has been accelerated by all of this and the shift to online, but like a Lowe's or, or a Home Depot, um, like how can you pivot the operations of your stores to maximize that real estate and still retain customers? Um, those are like malls are a, a bad use of space, right? They're hard to navigate. They need a, like the stores yeah. aren't that great. Right. If you could use your your physical retail store more as a customer acquisition channel, that would really change how people think about physical retail. Well, Matt, this is really uh, really informative uh, and uh, interesting uh, discussion. We've been talking to Matt Phillips about the whole concept of using and leveraging what the e-commerce world of home and lifestyle industry has has taught uh, Americans about how to feel comfortable online and and how we might take some of those insights and use them in uh, healthcare practices and particularly the selection of self care and personalized uh, product decision making and purchase. Matt, thanks very much for joining us. It's been really great. I think our listeners uh, have gotten a lot out of this uh, insight, and uh, I think we'll all get better, get beyond telemedicine and and thinking about telemedicine and and online engages as thinking that that's only digitization. It's it's really the fine art now of creating customer or patient engagement and interaction and then then making it stick. Matt, thanks for your time. Great talking to you. Thank you for joining us here at Chippa Chat. For more information and to hear our entire catalog of shows, please visit chpa.org.